All right, so um, first I'm gonna share my screen to just chat with uh, y'all about um, some important things I'd like us to acknowledge. Really quick. And I'd like to thank you in advance for um, my learning curve on Zoom, as I'm sure we all are learning through these challenging times. All right. Um, so first, just a little Zoom etiquette. I would love if everyone could stay on mute um, unless you are speaking. And we're gonna use the chat box tonight to ask questions. After each presentation, um, we're gonna have a questions session. So, and also, like I mentioned, the session is being recorded and will be uploaded to YouTube. So please turn off your camera if you'd like to remain offline. And before we begin, I would like to start with a land acknowledgement. We gratefully acknowledge the indigenous peoples on whose ancestral homelands we gather tonight, including the Chumash, the Salinan, the Esalen, the Tataviam, and the Costanoan peoples. We respect their sovereignty, their right to self-determination, and honor their sacred connection to the land as the original inhabitants and steward of what is designated now as the Los Padres National Forest. Wonderful. And with that, we've got our very first presentation from none other than our own executive director, uh, Brian Conant. So Brian, if you'd like to unmute yourself and give a little intro, and uh, then we will go from there to um, your presentation. All right. Hello, everybody. Good evening. Thanks for um attending the Zoom. Um, it's good to see so many familiar faces and names, people that we haven't seen in a while. Um, COVID's been kind of tough for us on our volunteer projects, but it's great to see. I feel like uh, if you guys remember Romper Room, I want to like look in the mirror and say hi to Mary and Shad and everybody else. And Craig, I, I tried to look for my fake beard for tonight and I couldn't find it. But um, anyway, I'm ready to go. Awesome. Okay. All right, Brian, go ahead. Okay, so first off, these seven minute presentations are great, but they go really fast. So I'll try to keep up here. Um, one of the most common questions that we get that I receive from people is, is just asking how the Santa Cruz Trail is. Is it in good enough condition to ride on? Can we hike it? Can we backpack it? So I thought what I would do tonight is just kind of give you guys a tour of, of the current condition of the Santa Cruz uh, National Recreation Trail. So for those of you who, who don't know, the Santa Cruz Trail, it's about 20 miles long. It goes from Upper Oso. This is in the Santa Barbara backcountry. Upper Oso, and it, it connects out to Mission Pine Basin in the San Rafael Wilderness. Uh, it is an epic trail. It, it's, it's engineered very, very fun to hike and ride. And it goes through a lot of different varying terrain. The part that we're going to focus on today is the first 10 miles of it that goes from Upper Oso campground from the trailhead at Upper Oso to Santa Cruz Station. This is the, par the part that's considered the National Recreation Trail. And as I mentioned, it's about 10 miles. It goes up and over Little Pine and then drops down into Santa Cruz. Uh, originally, the trail was used for, for uh, herding cattle and, and running cattle from the San Inez out to uh, the, the Santa Cruz. But uh, last 50 years or so, it's been primarily for recreational uses, hunting, hiking, backpacking, equestrian use, and, and a lot of mountain bike activity as well. Okay, here's our tour, all aboard. Thanks, I saw that Greg, choo-choo. Um, so if you're looking to get out there, you, you go over 154 from Santa Barbara, it's about 30 minutes, it takes you to Upper Oso Campground. And then you start off with about a mile hike on the Buckhorn OHV road, and then you get to the, the single track. Um, you can't really talk about the Santa Cruz Trail right now without understanding that it, it was impacted greatly by the, the Ray Fire from 2016. So you see some pictures here in the next couple slides showing some of the damage from the fire. Um, it's not quite as bad as it was, but it's, it's, it's been really annihilated um, due to fire. So our first stop on our tour of Santa Cruz is, is 19 Oaks Campground. It's about a mile up from the start of the single track. Uh, it's a very popular um, 
backpacking destination for scouts and, and kind of first time backpackers looking to go for a quick overnight. As you can see, it got burned pretty, pretty bad in the, in the Ray fire. But this is what it looks like right now. Um, we've been partnering with a Boy Scout troop from Goleta and uh, they put in tables, four new campsites, a new toilet, signs. It's in great shape. The trail up to 19 Oaks is in great shape. It's good to ride, hike, back, backpack. Uh, 19 Oaks is good to go. There's water in the creek as well. But above 19 Oaks, that's where the, the problems really start. This is the hanging crib wall section of, of Santa Cruz Trail below Little Pine. Um, as you can see, this was taken right after the fire. It looks pretty treacherous to try to hike across that, that crib wall section. It was bad before the fire. Um, the fire made it, made it downright treacherous and, and dangerous in spots. Uh, the picture here on the left, that was taken just a few weeks ago. Uh, people are getting across the slides, but it's a little scary. We've been hearing of people getting to the slides and turning around. Um, other people get through it okay. But um, we're hoping to get out there and, and, and work it here pretty soon in this next year and make it passable again. Cody goes fast. Next stop, Happy Hollow. So the top of, of Little Pine, you can see the picture here on the left. This is 2007. Look at all those nice, big, beautiful pine trees in there. And then 2020, um, the, 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 the bowl there at Happy Hollow just got completely nuked. And um, here's a few pictures that I found. I couldn't find any personal photos from before the fire, but on the left-hand side is a picture of, that Ray Ford took. Uh, you can see all the, the nice mature conifers. And then the picture on the right is from Bob Burtness, who we'll hear from later tonight, uh, showing the uh, guard station there. It's no longer there. And this is what it more or less looks like today. So that, that thick pine forest has been replaced with really just not a whole lot right now at, at Happy Hollow. It's still a nice place to go. Uh, the sunsets are really nice from the top of Little Pine, but uh, it certainly doesn't have the same appeal that it had before the fire. All right, continuing on. Uh, down from Happy Hollow, headed towards Santa Cruz, you get down to Alexander Saddle, and you're still in the Ray, the, the Ray Burn fire scar. And uh, the, the trail there kind of on the northwest side of Little Pine is still in, in tough, bad shape right now. There's some scary spots, some sketchy spots, some areas that are a little bit uh, hard to, to, to Traverse. All right, lunch break time. I'm going to speed up here a little bit. Continue on. Little Pine Spring is our next campsite along the, the, the trail. It's in good shape. It's got perennial water, good water. Um, it did not burn in the Ray Fire. It's a little hard to find, but otherwise it's, it's holding in there doing pretty good. All right, our next section is called the 40 mile wall. And this is a, a steep section that kind of feels like you're going for 40 miles, but it's, it's, it's of course not 40 miles, just feels like it. Um, it's also in rough shape. We've been trying to work our way up from Santa Cruz Station to get to the 40 mile wall so we can clear the, the, the tread again and rebench it. Um, we haven't quite gotten there yet. And then as you turn the corner and start to get into the main drainage of Santa Cruz, get the beautiful views of the San Rafaels up there in West Big Pine. And then you drop down some switchbacks that have been worked recently down to uh, Santa Cruz Creek and um, eventually to the campground there at the bottom at Santa Cruz Camp. And if you haven't been to Santa Cruz camp, it's, it's a beautiful spot. It's got a, a guard station that was built in the 1930s, a big, beautiful flag with oak trees and sycamores. It's, it's really a spectacular spot. And it's, it's holding up pretty good. The, the, the camp could use some more visitors, but otherwise it's, uh, it's in good shape and, and ready to enjoy. All right, so overall conditions for the Santa Cruz Trail. Um, Generally, I tell people you can get there if you're not scared of heights and you're okay with some sketchy spots, but be prepared to turn around. We've had quite a few people who have started in on the trail and they end up taking the road back because the trail is just a little bit too sketchy. Um, it's definitely not stock. Mountain bikes are not recommended above 19 Oaks. Um, you, can, you can make it to Santa Cruz, but expect to be a little freaked out and have to move a little fast at, at times. Uh, another alternate route to get out there would be to hike the road. You can hike the Buckhorn Road out to the Santa Cruz Jeepway and take that all the way down. Um, that is a way to get out to Santa Cruz. Um, but we are hoping to work on it here this, this coming year. I know um, we had a, a great fundraiser uh, for, for Giving Tuesday. We raised a bunch of money to work on the Santa Cruz Trail. I know that Sage is going to be working on it as well. And I think between the, the two of us, we, we should be able to get the trail reopened, hopefully here in the next six months or so. Um, I really wanted to talk about going beyond and into the wilderness areas and out to Mission Pine and, 
and uh, and Kellogg camp and stuff. And there just isn't enough time in, in seven minutes. I mean, I, I could talk about this for 75 minutes, but uh, we'll also be doing some working vacations this this spring at Santa Cruz Station and working in in towards the wilderness area. Um, that should be a lot of fun. I know there's there's a lot of brush back there that's that's waiting for us to get in there and and cut it. So um, hopefully COVID will relinquish a little bit and we'll be able to have some some good uh, volunteer projects out there. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Brian. Um, I would love uh, if anyone has any questions. Um, we're happy to. Uh, answer them now. Feel free to pop them in the chat and I will um, read them out or I see a hand raised. I have a question. Oh, sorry. Also, um, I just wanted to say that if you're interested to learn more about the work that we've done on the Santa Cruz Trail, you can check it out on our website. Um, we've got some great before and afters. Craig's question is, when will the schedule for spring projects be released? Um, we actually have our tentative schedule up on our website on the events calendar section. Um, we have scheduled a bunch of projects and we're excited to hopefully host them. Um, right now due to COVID, we are still kind of touch and go with whether or not they'll be uh, able to happen. So we thought it would be best to get dates on the calendar um, and let people know if the situation is going to change um, as things unfold. So um, I can pop that into the chat box for everyone to take a look at. Um, great question. Yeah, we, we've been trying. We had our first volunteer project was supposed to be um, next week at, on the Red Reef Trail, and we just had to push that back. Um, Forest Service isn't allowing projects just yet. But um, I just found out today my kids are going back to school uh, March 1st. So I think, um, I, I think we should be able to do some volunteer projects uh, probably starting in, in early March, I would, I would guess. Looking forward to it. Anybody else have any questions for Brian about the Santa Cruz Trail? No. Awesome. I also just wanted to say thank you everyone who participated in our um, Giving Tuesday campaign. I see some familiar names out there. So um, that was a, a huge uh, boon to help us get the work going out on the Santa Cruz Trail. And um, we're going to be doing more fundraising efforts uh, to continue the work out there. So thank you everyone for that. And um, so up next is uh, Mr. Bob Burtness. So Bob, if you'd like to uh, unmute yourself and give your, a little introduction for yourself. I'm all set. <clears throat> a little introduction. Well, my name is Bob Burtness and I've been <clears throat> hiking the back country since I was uh, <clears throat> scout age, about 12 years old. And uh, there's so much to see at ground level, not as much from the air, but it's a great playground and we're very fortunate to have it, have the access to it so close, whether it's the front country or even the back country. Um, you have to drive a few more miles to get there, but it's uh, been a wonderful classroom for me and I just want to enjoy it as long as I'm allowed to do so. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Bob. And I'm pulling your presentation up now. Okay. And ready, set, go. Okay. When the National Forest System <clears throat> was created in 1891, the primary purpose of it was to protect the watersheds. Uh, all civilizations need water, but of course they quickly discovered that to protect a watershed, you need to protect the vegetation that grows there. And so a lot of fire protection uh, <clears throat> was needed. At the same time, we had some terrific fires and so here's a history of the uh, lookouts. The first one was built in uh, 1914 by John LeBeau near Zaka Lake. Uh, it was 10 feet high and it had an umbrella on top. 
Here you see one in Medulce, 1940, a friend of mine, Bob Carlson, uh, spent the summer there after he graduated from Santa Barbara High School. And uh, he enjoyed flashing, a, blinking a flashlight with the lookout over in, at the Kuyama Peak. Neither one of them knew Morse code, so they uh, blinked their flashlights at each other. Bob was a great guy. He uh, became the head of seven companies eventually, he was very athletic. There he is, uh, great sense of humor. Uh, he died just a few years ago. His widow lives not far from here. So you can see what the inside of Medulce looked like uh, at that time. There's a bed there, great views, and uh, just a nice place for a, a summer job. That's what it looks like today when I was up there a few years back. I took a photograph of it. Apparently the hot shots or uh, some Forest Service group came in and, um, and, and torched it, perhaps because it was a nuisance or a hazard or something like that. Unfortunately, they erased history at the same time. So that's what's left. Lacumbra Lookout, this is not the first one, but the second one that was built in 1945 with experimental sloped windows like you would find on aircraft control towers. That tower is still there, it's not being used right now, uh, but it's hopefully it can be preserved uh, among the few lookouts that are left to tell the story. I was working with the Youth Conservation Corps at that time, so we would take tours around the forest, and here are two of uh, our young members inside the, uh, the uh, look, look out there. That's not a bobcat, that's a uh, domestic cat, I think. But it was a great visit. So you're exactly at 4,000 feet on the floor of the Lacuba Lookout. McPherson Lookout, I think it was abandoned by the time this picture was taken, <clears throat> 5,700 feet. So it's up there and you have a pretty good view of things around. That's on the uh, Sierra Madre range, of course. I don't know how many people have seen one of these, but a, a friend of mine who helps to maintain the Dabney cabin, Brad Spencer, showed me this. He had a relative that used one of these in a lookout. So the idea was of a lightning storm came along, thunder and lightning. You were supposed to stand on this tool, stool and you would be protected. I'm not sure how effective it was, but it was interesting. Here's a letter dated 1942 to uh, establish an aircraft warning service stations within the forest boundaries. There were already fire lookouts, but they wanted some to hunt for a foreign aircraft that might be invaded in the United States. So uh, this was approved and their secondary purpose would be to um, uh, spot fires, but the primary purpose was to spot aircraft and report them. Uh, by radio to a central facility, probably in Los Angeles. Fourth Fighter Command was in charge of this whole operation, and this uh, certificate establishes uh, one of those stations. I don't know where, where 28 Neil 2 was. These were all volunteers that manned the station, and of course, they, uh, they, they weren't paid, but they got nice little souvenirs like this uh, pin, and you'll notice it says AWS on there, Fourth Fighter Command at the top. And this came from the museum up in the uh, Forest Museum up in uh, Montana. Uh, buttons were also made available. Again, aircraft warning service, volunteer observers, everybody got one of those. If a husband and wife uh, were working together, that would be, be considered the, uh, the crew. There are usually two people manning um, these uh, stations or observation posts, as they call them. If you were the head of that group, I guess you would get one of these patches, chief observer to sew on your uniform or shirt or whatever you had available. So there was lots of forms of recognition at that time and then that was great. When um, I was doing the uh, field uh, studies on the uh, Boy Scout camping book back in 1960, uh, Dave Weaver, who's pictured here, and I went to a number of these places and one of our stops was the Miranda Spring uh, uh, Aircraft Warning Station. I don't know what was called that, but here's another one at Plaskett Ridge, which is in the Monterey District. This was taken during World War II. It's a very standard design, but their living quarters were down, down below. They had um, tanks for fuel and water tanks and things like that so they could stay there for quite a while. This is the one station, one observation post still in existence. It was at Salisbury uh, Peak. And then after the war, it was uh, put on skids and hauled down to a spring. It's now known as the Jackson Cabin. 
Uh, I would like to see it preserved in some way if some arrangement could be made. It's used as a line shack. As you can see, the roof needs some attention as well as the sides. And while the inside could still be used for its present purpose, the outside, maybe this could be a good L LPFA project. We have some volunteer uh, carpenters uh, to restore that. Because as I say, I think it's the only one of about six or seven that were put into the forest. Here's a side view of the uh, Salisbury uh, observation post. As you can see, it needs a little attention. The inside actually looks better than the outside. Uh, uh, Dave and my brother George and I were surveying the Sweetwater Trail one weekend. So we, we had lunch in this cabin. There's Dave Weaver, many of you know him. And you can see the beds there and a stove and all the comforts of home. And of course it was right down near the spring. So there was run, running water too. And that's the second member of our crew, a little different view. You can see the bed and the stove and uh, we were enjoying a very nice lunch there. So that was our trip. And I, I didn't know exactly what this structure was. I thought it was some form of a lookout, not realizing it was an aircraft warning station. I do have a six and a half page manuscript in pr progress right now, which I'd be happy to share with anybody that's interested. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Bob, for sharing with that. Um, amazing, amazing stuff to see, especially the historical photos. Um, feel free if anyone has questions to ask Bob to put those in the chat. Chad asks, how can we read your manuscripts? Okay, I'd be happy to email it to them. If you'll send me your uh, email address, I'll just pull it off the screen and uh, send it to you. That has a lot more deals than I've had, um, details than I've had time to share with you tonight. My email address, I don't know if it's on, is it there any place or shall I just go ahead and give it? You can put it in the chat box if you'd like, Bob, or I can do that too. We'll do that, okay. Um, Alex wants to know what kind of planes uh, was the AWS looking for? Uh, primarily Japanese, uh, because as you know, the after the invasion of Hawaii, there were some incursions toward this country. A number of our ships were sunk offshore. There was the attack on uh, Elwood in 1942 by a Japanese submarine. Uh, there was one Japanese uh, launch, uh, a plane launched from a submarine that started some fires in Oregon. Uh, there were some bloom bombs that were launched from Japan, flew over to this uh, country. Uh, uh, there was one uh, group of fatalities that landed in Oregon, a Sunday school group, um, uh, got a hold of some of these bloom bombs, started dragging and they exploded and killed six people, unfortunately. Uh, some of these bombs went as far as Kansas. So what they were looking for was foreign aircraft. In fact, the, uh, the uh, bomber I wrote about that crashed in the forest was thought at first to be a Japanese plane, but it, it wasn't. Thank you, Craig. There it is on the screen. <laughs> so it's still available on uh, Amazon or the publisher. I understand. Um, we've got another question from Ryan. Is there still a tower on Topa Peak? On, on Topa? Mm -hmm. That I don't know. Uh, I suspect not, but I, I don't really know. Um, maybe uh, Craig or one of the others would know about that. And it sounds like we've got lots of folks who are interested in protecting the Jackson cabin and even some interested uh, volunteers. Um, Craig said he's going to address Topotopa in a bit, which is great. Um, if anyone is interested in volunteering, um, please email volunteer at lpforest.org and we will get you connected to the right place to go. So big round of applause for Bob. Thank you so much. Great job. You're welcome. <laughs> and um, next up is Alex Wilson. So Alex, 
you want to go ahead and unmute yourself and hopefully your audio is working. Yes, it's so nice to see everyone here tonight. I uh, wish we could all be here in person uh, around the campfire. That will happen sooner rather than later, I'm confident. A little about me, uh, I grew up here in Ventura and I graduated from UC Santa Barbara. And so throughout my life, I've had a lot of experiences in the Los Padres National Forest. And it's a place I really love. I think the very first time I ever saw snow was when my dad took me to Rose Valley and uh, saw snow when I was five years old. And over the years, I got involved with hiking with the Sierra Club and uh, done a lot of hiking with them. And I've been involved in journalism for about 30 years. And I've covered the Los Padres Forest extensively on fires and uh, other kind of fun stories. My first trail building experience was with Heidi Anderson on the, one of those uh, first Saturday missions. I went to write about it and had so much fun that I, I kept doing trail work. And I've been doing it ever since. And uh, I used to write an outdoors column for the VC Reporter uh, called Outdoor Observer. And uh, that's when I got, in, got involved with the LPFA initially, was uh, writing about the Condor Trail. I'll tell you a little more about that in uh, just a moment. But as I say, I love to be in the forest and I love to be uh, hanging out with all of you guys there doing volunteer work and, and having fun and, and learning all these interesting things like we are here tonight. So even though we're not able to be together in person, this is a nice forum for us to see each other and maybe share things in a little different way. So, so thank you for being here tonight. Ah, and thank you. And with that, I'm going to share my screen. And I'm ready to start. Pretty okay, soon. great. Oops, sorry about that. All right. Okay, I figured out how to make the full screen work. <laughs> and I'm ready, set, go. Okay, well, welcome everyone to my seven minute story. It's called Critters, Vittles, Dirt, and Good Company. It's about how fun it is to volunteer with the Los Padres Forest Association and how I'm hoping that we will all be back to normal very soon so we can hang out together. Hoping this presentation will make you laugh and cry, and it'll be an emotional roller coaster. Uh, like I was saying, I've been involved in journalism for about 30 years. Here's a picture of uh, me uh, covering uh, an oil tank fire in the forest near Fillmore. There's me interviewing Ken Burns and Huell Hauser, if you know who he is, about the National Forest. But there's one thing that was my favorite story ever the Condor Trail. The Condor Trail is my favorite thing to ever. Cover. I think I was the first person to actually write a newspaper about the Condor Trail. I saw something about it on social media, and I was under the mistaken impression that it actually existed. I learned that it was more conceptual, but I still wrote about it. And then a few years later, I had the opportunity to interview Brittany about her first experience actually completing it. And that got me into doing more volunteer work with the LPFA and going out and, and having a good time. And I got my girlfriend, Sandy, who's here tonight involved also. And she's in this picture on the bottom. And uh, this newspaper article here, actually I didn't write that, but there's a picture of Sandy and I in it. So I, I posted that. I got to teach Sandy how to backpack as a result of doing these trips with you guys. Here we are on a trip to Medulce, which was her first time backpacking, but since then, We've been backpacking in the High Sierra. We've been to about a dozen national parks. And so we're really enjoying all of that. I promised vittles. Here's some vittles. This is a, a, that trip to Medulce. This is a trip where we had stock support. So we had the ability to carry in heavy cooking equipment and lots of beer to drink after we work. You can see that uh, Mary is uh, about ready to dig in. I'm not quite sure what we're eating, but it looks absolutely delicious. And here we are at Bluff Cabin. Another thing I love about volunteering with the LPFA is that we get access to these places that most people don't get to drive to because they're behind locked gates. And I don't know what's cooking on the grill here, but I can almost smell it. It looks mm -hmm. so good. I think it might be tri-tip and look at that cake. The cake looks amazing. You know, one of the things that I, besides, you know, the camaraderie, 
the, the, the beauty of the, of the Los Padres. It's like a subtle beauty. It's not like Yosemite or the Grand Canyon that like knocks you over the head with it. It's something that you can appreciate when you look at it very closely, like these flowers and this weird insect inside of a flower and the cultural history. Um, here's Manzana Schoolhouse. Imagine what it would be like to be there in the 19th century, trying to homestead these areas and how difficult that would be. And then here I am at Camp, Camp Scheidek, which isn't really historical. They're kind of like made up phony little buildings, but a fun place to be. And my favorite thing, one of my favorite things has been working to fix up the volunteer wilderness ranger cabin near Paradise Road. And here we are having a nice day. There's Bob there giving a talk. And it looks like someone's got a digger a do there in the foreground. And of course, we've also got a nice keg of beer there from Island Brewer Brewery. Give them a give them a hand. One of my favorite things I worked on at the at the cabin was uh, was this fire was this fire uh, ring. Other things included like tearing down an old dilapidated doghouse with a sledgehammer. But Sandy and I really loved building this fire ring, and I'm hoping that it will be around it soon again. Second favorite thing we ever built were these breakfast burritos. You can see that there was major renovation going on on the cabin. There's a paper on the window because they were actually painting that day. And I think somebody maybe said, yeah, Alex, um, I think maybe we should give him a spatula instead of a power tool or a paint sprayer. And this summer I had an opportunity to volunteer at the Wheeler Gorge Visitor Center during the times when we were all on lockdown. And, you know, we were feeling socially isolated. And so it was really nice to, to talk to so many people and uh, be able to share my forest experience and especially for people who had never been to the forest before. We sometimes talk to 100 people a day. And when there weren't people stopping by, the birds there were amazing. I love to hang out with the birds. We had hummingbirds, stellars, jays, red-headed woodpeckers. And as you can see, this uh, condor came to visit us like almost every day uh, because he's actually about over 100 years old and uh, He's actually been dead longer than he's been alive. Mm -hmm. uh, on a more somber note, you know, things that happen, you know, sometimes like the Montecito mud debris flows and the Thomas fire. It was just unfathomably sad to imagine the loss of life and the property damage. And this is a picture in the right hand upper screen of a house that had mud come through it 10 feet deep. But amazingly, you know, it got fixed up and it's so nice to see it fixed now. And this was a trail work day that we did with a bunch of other trail user groups like the Montecito Trails Foundation and Santa Barbara City Parks. And it was just an example of like everybody coming together and really helping to work, help the community and get us through these tough times. I think we had a hundred people on that, on that trail day. That might've been one of the biggest ones ever. And uh, this was a, this is the trail at Cold Spring and it, um, used to have a bench there. It was just completely different, but these volunteers built this beautiful sign that I'm not taking credit for, but I'm standing next to it in a picture because it was great. Also, even during COVID, we managed to do some things. Here's a socially distanced trail day. You can see me near Red Rock with a sock. So if that sock belongs to anyone, I kept it, I washed it, and I can FedEx it to you if you need me to. Also, the trash in this poison oak at the bottom, I didn't know if I should pick it up, but I did because I wanted to. Also, Sandy and I took this uh, backpacking course with the LPFA. We learned all kinds of things about how to backpack lightly and, and cut your toothbrush in two if you need to, to save a few grams. And But you know what else I learned? Hike your own hike. Mm -hmm. So Sandy and I brought our whole little furniture set there so we could have a wine and cheese party on the Manzana River. And I guess the point is whether you want to go bird watching or rock climbing, whatever you want to do in the forest is up to you, just as long as you respect the nature and everybody else. And uh, on a final note, this is my uh, goal for the future. I'm hoping that we can have a fundraiser and raise enough money to buy the Wheeler Hot Spring resort property and rebuild this swimming pool. We could also have bands and we could have a lot of fun there. And as ridiculous as that seems, wouldn't that be amazing to bring the Wheeler Hot Spring Resort back to life? So 
Thank you very much uh, for listening to my presentation. I'm open for any kinds of uh, questions you might have. Thank you, Alex. Love to see all the variety there. I feel like you covered uh, a lot of what we do and it was great to see um, see some of the highlights from even this year um, that despite all of our distancing, we, we got to have you out on some, some projects. So thank you. Um, I, this is a great question that I don't know the answer to. So Matthew asks, is the Wheeler Spring property for sale? It, it's been for sale for years. And before the Thomas fire, it was my understanding that someone almost bought it to make it into a yoga retreat. But I think that all fell through after all the buildings burned down. It's probably still for sale. I, I, I highly doubt that it'll ever be a hot spring resort again but it's kind of just, I wish it would be. So I believe it is for sale. It might be about $2 million and it would be had to dump another 4 million into, do, into it to do anything with it probably. Gotcha. And um, there was a question about the goats. I can answer that. Uh, those uh, goats belong to Laura Dukey, uh, who is an amazing volunteer and her goats help pack out a lot of trash on cleanup projects. The very first goat in the first slide was one of Mike's goats. That picture was maybe six or seven years old. And uh, those goats were very hardy and carried a lot of uh, tools and beer. And uh, that's when I first uh, met the goats and was intrigued by them and uh, enjoyed taking pictures of them. They're very photogenic. Awesome. We've got a request from Steve that you um, play something on the guitar for us next time, Alex. So we might have to have a, an open mic night um, with all of our talented LPFA musicians. I know there's a, a bunch of them out there. So <laughs> wonderful. Um, and Brian asks for Mel. Yes. <laughs> Mel Cooter is my rock star alter ego, and he has uh, appeared at a few uh, events before. Um, so he, he will be back, and everyone will be invited to bring your guitars and sing along. Wonderful. Thank you, Alex. Big round of applause for you. Thank you so much. <laughs> All right. Um, next up, in our evening is Scott McClintock. So Scott, if you'd like to unmute yourself and uh, give us a little intro and we'll jump into your, uh, we'll jump into your presentation here. Okay, thank you. Good, good evening, everybody. I'm Scott, I'm from the Forest Fire Lookout Association. I've been with them since 2009. Spent a lot of time with binoculars pressed up to my eyeballs and um, we're going to talk tonight about the operation at Chews Ridge, way up at the, the top of the Monterey District. All right, you ready? Yeah. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry, everybody. All right, Scott, you're good to go. Okay. Uh, I'm a director with the FFLA. We're a nationwide not-for-profit organization whose mission is to preserve the remaining 2,500 towers in the country, or at least their histories. Sometimes we can't preserve them. We think the towers are irreplaceable symbols of American forestry. And we are the keepers of the online National Historic Lookout Register, a nationwide inventory of all those towers. On our website, you can pick a state and select any of the towers and read about its status and a little bit about its history. And as you see, California has some 226 towers. As of two years ago, there were no towers working on the Los Padres specifically for fire detection anymore. Why did they close the lookout towers? Back in the late 80s, the Forest Service and state fire agencies were hit with budget shortfalls. Those were the days before unleaded gasoline and smog was reducing the visibility from towers. The agencies had to spend their limited money on fire suppression and they shuttered the lookouts, most of them. I used to be chairman of the San Diego Riverside chapter of the FFLA, but in 2017, I was assigned as director of the South California Division. 
there was a big gap in tower preservation projects between the Angeles and the Bay Area. And I was sent up here from San Diego to see if we could get any preservation projects going. So I first went to the easy one, High Mountain Lookout, which is east of San Luis Obispo, had already been reconditioned by the forest biologists and wildlife groups to serve as a condor tracking station. So all I had to do was train the staff in smoke recognition and reporting. I made them a training video and put it online so the staff up there can serve a dual mission. Now I wanted to work on Lacumbra Peak. Bob mentioned Lacumbra earlier. Um, that was my favorite and I had actually entered Lacumbra a, a while ago, there it is. Uh, but it's surrounded by communications antennas and there's a sign there that says it's dangerous to even be there because of all the radi radiation from the uh, Kendra, our timing got all screwed up here. Should we pause for a minute? All right, we'll jump ahead. What, what? There it is. Okay, so there's a sign up there because of the radiation of those communications towers that it's unsafe to be at the site of the Lacumbra Tower. And you see light coming through the ceiling there, the roof tiles where it is in very bad repair right now. But that was one of my favorites. I did find Choose Ridge though, up at the top of the Monterey district. And there she is. Um, it had been closed for 30 years and sat vacant and the roof leaked enough rainwater to destroy all the furnishings, the drywall and part of the floorboards. Additionally, no one on the Forest Service knew what had happened to the Osborne Firefinder, but we did find an old one in the Santa Maria warehouse and had to have it overhauled and make it serviceable for, for the project. The staff at the ranger district up there suggested that I tap the Ventana Wilderness Alliance for volunteers. They had an extensive social media network and the word spread quickly. Also, this tiny article appeared deep in the local Carmel newspaper, which helped a lot. And in two seasons, we signed up the optimal number of 60 volunteers. During the closure, the Forest Service used the tower as a mount for radio antennas and at times to house their radio repeaters. This worked well for a number of years until colonies of mice and rats moved in and set up numerous nests. It turns out rodent urine knocks out repeaters. So they took the repeaters out and installed that metal uh, vault at the base of the tower to house all the electronics and that freed up the tower for a restoration project. And on the left there, you see one of the many rats nests we had to clear out. On the right is one of our volunteers spraying a chlorine solution against potential hantavirus as we began clearing it all out and rehabilitating the interior of the cab. This was the nastiest of the work and this took about four days. We then replaced rotted floorboards, installed new floor tiles, drywall, and rehabilitated the almost 100 year old pit toilet. We replaced old plywood uh, floorboards and, and we replaced the uh, old plywood that used to cover the windows with hinged shutters. And the engine crew from Arroyo Seco station came up and trimmed the trees and burned off the slash piles for us. Then it was time to build a map cabinet, a wardrobe, a lightning proof bed and other things. We took a shortcut and bought a desk and kitchen cabinets from Ikea. We selected the government green color from a 1964 tower specification, put that on the walls and the ceiling. You see the rehabilitated firefighter there in the middle of the cab. With the cab equipped, we classroom trained new volunteers in safety, tower operations, smoke recognition, fire reporting, radio protocols, lightning operations, information resources, and rules and regs. Since the pandemic, we've had to convert all of that training into online videos, and that was quite the task. But now we've got it out there ready to train people on their computer. In addition to classroom training, everyone had to work a shift in a tower with a trainer, and then they were ready to work on their own. So on August 25th in 19, we deployed the first operational shift and deployed a total of 65 shifts that season. We tried to staff two volunteers per shift for safety and found that domestic couples, husband and wife teams, make very good lookout teams. So what do the volunteers do up there all day? They do this. They were required to perform a comprehensive 360 degree scan of their view shed every 15 minutes. They also monitor Forest Service, Cal Fire and Monterey County fire radio frequencies so that they know what's burning and where. We call that situational awareness, very important for them. And this is what they're looking for. We're trained to alert for the wispy faint smoke that you see there on the left in the V-notch. 
from an infant fire that just started, as opposed to the one in the inset that's had time to start growing big. Anybody could spot that one. And due to the terrain, 99% of the smokes we see are from behind a ridge line. We seldom see the actual flame in a forest fire. So when we spot smoke like that, the volunteer then sights the smoke with the Osborne Firefinder, calculates the azimuth and distance, and radios those numbers into the Forest Communication Center. There, dispatchers enter that data into a computer that generates a map with the location of the fire. We then stand by to answer questions on the radio from the responding units and help guide them into where, where it is. However, up there, there are not a lot of roads, so most of their response is done by aircraft. Last September, tower operations were interrupted by the Carmel and the Dolan fires, each causing us to shudder and evacuate the tower. On the left, you see the Dolan fire about 11 miles away showing some huge flame links. And that was two nights before we bugged out. Between those two evacuations, we were closed for a total of 29 days. Now, I know it's not cool to throw stats at you in a meeting like this, but look at the set of numbers down there at the bottom. The Carmel fire burned in the Keshawa area, which is where about half of our volunteers live. You see that 14 of our people were evacuated from their homes, eight had property damage, and two lost their homes completely. I just, just talked to one of those guys the other day. He's, he's got a long way to go to get rebuilt. But impact like that fuels our volunteers' motivation. And here's a couple of potential future projects. Here's Cone Peak Lookout on the coast in Big Sur there on the left, and Figueroa Mountain just north of Solvang. Both are in good shape because they're metal and they've held up well over the years. And both actually have better view sheds than Choose Ridge. We've got our eye on these two repairable lookouts, but we'll see what the Los Padres says about it. They know I want to move in there, but we'll see what they say. They've been really busy. So if you're interested in more information, we have a website for the Monterey chapter of the FFLA, and we have a lot of fun exchanging anecdotes and photos on our Facebook group. Also, Kendra is posting a link to our 13 minute orientation video if you'd like to see that. That's what we use to screen people who want to come and be lookouts. So come and visit us at the tower during the fire season. We'll be there every day and tell them you're a member of the LPFA. We'll give you a VIP tour. Thank you, everybody. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Scott. Um, any questions for Scott, please pop them into the chat box. And meanwhile, I will find that training video. Or I could send it to you again. No worries. All right, everybody, here is the very detailed uh, training link. Um, it is really inspirational to have this as a guide, uh, Scott, since we at the LPFA have also been chatting about uh, ways that we can make some of our training virtual. So it's good to see that other orgs have done it and done it successfully. Uh, so thank you. Yeah, we found that uh, Mac products have this movie making uh, app on them and it works really well, even for low tech people like me. It goes pretty good. Wonderful. Brian says Thorn Point in the Cespi is uh, a great option to restore as well. Yeah, I've, I've uh, got my eye on that too. Good to hear. Any more questions from Scott out there? No. All right. Well, thank you so much, Scott. You're Big welcome. Applause for you. Um, so yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, of course. I think it's so interesting that we had so many uh, folks talking about the lookouts. I love the theme. It's great. <laughs> um, so up next, we've got uh, the Los Padres wildlife enthusiast, Matt Caliguri. Hi, Matt, you want to say hello and unmute yourself? Yeah, hi, everybody. Good evening. Thanks for having me. Happy to be here. Happy to be uh, sharing and part of this uh, amazing community. Uh, some of you I know, most of you I don't. Um, so thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for being here. 
Uh, I'm going to go ahead and share your presentation. Cool. Have you done, Kendra, have you done any with video files before? Uh, yes, and they'll play automatically. Uh, cool. I'm, not, yeah. I'm not as concerned about the, the timing of things. Okay, right on. All right. And cool. here you go. All right. So hi, everybody. I'm Matt Caligiri in Santa Barbara and uh, happy to spend seven minutes sharing uh, a passion project, essentially, uh, which me and a friend, a couple other friends have, have given the name Los Padres uh, Wildlife Enthusiasts. Um, so a quick update or a quick, uh, quick hit on the origins of, of this concept. Um, you know, I guess it was kind of around the early time of the pandemic that we were just all a little bit unsettled and trying to figure out, you know, what are we going to do? Can we go outside? Can we hit the trail? Can we be active outside? How uh, how can we interact with the forest in a new way? Um, we we're just getting a little restless. And so um, a friend, this guy, Paul Heckman on the left and me on the right, we had a pretty amazing banner day, uh, one trip out from Romero Saddle out to the Oasis in the springtime. And there were migrating birds up at the at the saddle. Whoa, are we going? We're going so fast. Maybe I'm just going so slow. Um, anyway, we were we were just thinking, hey, we got to find a way to um, find and share uh, wildlife photos and videos that um, that gave us the opportunity to connect with others in the community, in the forest community. Um, I forgot that I kept a picture of uh, Tony Soprano in there, but the reason why I did was because. Uh, despite him being a fairly vile character, uh, the storytelling around him is so good. You get to know him so well and you can't help but love him so, um, or support him or, or be interested in him. So we wanted to do the same thing for uh, wildlife that we uh, were encountering in the, in the, in the forest. So um, here's a couple quick images of some things we've been seeing and we'll do this for the next few slides. But um, these are both images of California Baja tree frog taken from about 10 feet apart uh, at the same time, two different species, um, or sorry, one species, two different iterations of that, of that frog, which is so neat. Um, and the next few slides are going to focus on black bear that we've been seeing recently. Um, we just decided we'd start paying more attention to scat and to prints and to scratches, things that most of you folks have seen uh, they, you know, time and time again out on the trail. Um, we started to, to really just decide, hey, let's, let's pay it closer attention to these signs. Let's get a trail cam and let's see, see what we can see. We really wanted to know, you know on, in real time what was happening out there. So um, we've just been able to find uh, a really wide array of results really quickly once we started to really kind of dial in um, and see what we could find and what we could record, what we could get photos and videos, images of. Um, so that was, uh, we've got black bear here for the next few slides. Some like this one that are enormous and uh, just so impressive to have effectively in our backyard. Most of these, if not all of these video clips are from the transverse range and most on, um, you know, on the either the front country or mid country slope um, that we've been able to record and uh, happily start to share with, with other folks that are interested. So we call ourselves uh, Los Padres Wildlife Enthusiasts, uh, LP We for short and um, have quickly been able to just compile a lot of interesting uh, videos, a lot of uh, amazing uh, photography that we're slowly getting better at. And uh, all of this is from like a, effectively the last few months, um, last couple of months that is happening, you know, in real time. And we're happy to be able to capture it and, and share it with other enthusiasts, other wildlife enthusiasts. So. Um, definitely, it's a, it's a citizen science or a community science project, and I don't have a biology background necessarily, but uh, like to, um, you know, think of myself as a, as a growing, or constantly learning amateur naturalist, and um, 
this has just given me and my and my buddy Paul and, and another friend Micah just the opportunity to continue to engage um, our local ecosystems and uh, increase our knowledge as amateur naturalists and share it too, uh, which has been fantastic. Um, also, everyone loves a a black bear cub, so we were able to get some pretty neat footage of some cubs. Uh, all of these locations are pretty deep and really far off trail um, game trails, just trying to follow the signs and track a little bit um, so we can, we can capture the local flora and fauna. Um, so that was a, I'm not sure how well the, the video translated for you guys, the viewers, but um, I do, uh, I am sharing a lot of these right now currently on Instagram um, under the, uh, the moniker Los Padres uh, underscore wildlife underscore enthusiasts. So uh, follow along if you can. And um, it's been really fun. Honestly, it's been fun to collect and share and to feel connected to other organizations, other enterprises, other groups of people or individuals that are already doing amazing work in the, in the forest. Uh, and for me, as someone who hasn't, you know, necessarily connected with the local community as much, especially this past year, it's been really fun personally and really uh, enriching. Okay, so the next few slides are what I think are some of the coolest clips from the year, from the most interesting clips, um, the most surprises. Uh, this was... Uh, something that I, I've never seen a spotted skunk until these couple clips. And um, I think they're fairly rare and fairly hard to come by. I think they're not seen very often at all. And I've just been really excited to get uh, spotted skunk, Western spotted skunk, um, several times on the camera this year. Um, everybody loves the mountain lion. Everybody loves the black bear. Everybody loves some of the big mega fauna, uh, but I really like a, sp a spotted skunk. I'll take a spotted skunk any day. Um, so yeah, so we'll be sharing more of these on Instagram and, and hopefully on a website relatively soon um, where some of the imagery will just be um, better to easy access and, and better quality. Um, yeah, so the next slide, I believe, will show another kind of one of the grail mammals of the forest that uh, we only saw once this year. Um, and it's a ringtail. Some people, some people call this a ringtail cat or a miner's cat. Um, but this is kind of one of the denizens of the rocky outcroppings of our, of our forest areas. And um, it's, this is not a great clip but it's the only one we got of a ringtail this year. So I really wanted to include it. Um, if you want to see it more clearly or better, follow up with me and I'll send you a, I'll send you a link. Um, and the, yeah, I'm, I'm really hoping to connect with someone else this year that might, so maybe someone with a, a biology or science background that might turn me on to some other locations that might be better for, for ringtail. And uh, of course, um, a couple really neat mountain lion clips that are relatively fresh. This one's actually from March. This is probably one of the first, first clips we got when we started doing it. Um, and that was extremely exciting to say the least. Um, and hopefully you guys are, being, are able to see this relatively smoothly. I think they're only like 15 or 20 second clips, Kendra. So um, it's just a little teaser, but super fun to share. Super fun to share. Yeah, I'd love to talk with any of you that have any information about ringtails that uh, might have a good uh, scout scouting location. Um, so yeah, so it's obviously it's um, the big mammals are fun, but so are uh, the flowers and so are the shrubs and so are the trees and so are the salamanders. Um, so are the fish, so are the critters, all of them. Um, and so this has been just a, an exercise to um, 
help me just tune in a little bit more and connect a little bit more and also um, do my part to help others as well. Because we all say we love, everyone says they love nature and they love um, the outdoors. But I think uh, in an effort to be better conservationists and better kind of community citizens, um, increasing our literacy and our ability to know what's around us is, is really important. And so I'm a, I'm a new dad generally, and that's a big concern of mine is just to help try and raise a, a younger generation that knows what they're seeing and uh, cares for it in a certain way. Um, just like that picture of Tony Soprano, I was like, we end up caring for people and things that we know about, right? And so I just, uh, this project is an effort to learn and connect and help other folks um, continue to, to know, especially, especially maybe the younger generations, continue to know, continue to uh, understand what's out there in our own backyard, uh, which is so valuable so precious so um this is the email for our little uh, group our passion project group los padres wildlife at gmail.com and currently um, instagram is where we're sharing our footage and our musings and our photos so um thanks so much for the time um thanks kendra this is a real endeavor a real herculean effort to compile all this and and to host it. So uh, thank you so much. And um, yeah, lots of gratitude to everybody out there. Thank you so much, Matt. I, for one, am a huge fan of uh, your your work. And I love um, seeing all the animals out there. Um, so awesome. So thank mm -hmm. you for doing this project. Uh, and thank you for sharing these clips. They're amazing. Um, one question was, what bird are those beautiful feathers from? Yeah, that's a great question. Yeah, looks like a few of you on the chat are already on it, which is so, so cool. Uh, yeah, that's a northern flicker. Um, and here in the west, west of the Rockies, we have uh, red shafted flicker is the subspecies. Um, out east where I'm actually grew up in Connecticut and the, the flicker out there is yellow shafted, but uh, we are, uh, we're, we are in the red shafted area here in this environment. So um, yeah, I think that picture was, I'm guessing it was maybe some owl or a bird of prey that um, probably bashed a flicker and had it for lunch or, or breakfast. So the feathers were flying. Um, there could be another, uh, another explanation, but that was my, my best guess when I came across that. That was on um, on Bear Creek, the north slope of Bear Creek, which has been uh, pretty fun recently to explore. Awesome. And Roger wants to know, do you record these videos on iNaturalist as well? That's a good question. I haven't. I should. I am personally like a little jaded with iNaturalist. I think it's just I wish it was more user friendly. I wish it was uh, a little less time consuming to use. I think it's really valuable and I would encourage people to use it and I should use it more, um, but I haven't. And, uh, you know, I think that's, it's worth, it's, it's an amazing and valuable tool and database. And, um, you know, I think that's a good reminder. I think, I think that that information, especially now that I'm spending more time uh, trying to, you know, collect data should be, should be logging that somewhere, um, somewhere else. So it's a good reminder. And um, just as a little plug, we actually have a few more virtual events coming up. Uh, one of them includes uh, partnering with the Santa Barbara Botanic Garden, where we will be doing a training on iNaturalist. That's cool. Uh, yeah, specifically focusing on invasive plants. Cool. Uh, but, you know, it's the same training for everybody. So um, look for that. We'll probably uh, be doing that in March or April. That's um, cool. Is that with Scott Pipkin? Uh, Josie or Lassange. Josie, cool. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. yeah, they're doing awesome stuff over there. Yeah, yeah definitely. Um, so that is coming up for everyone who's looking for more fun virtual events. We'll be doing that and sharing more details with that soon. Um, any more questions for Matt? 
No. All right. Well, thank you so much, Matt. And everyone, please do check out uh, if you're on Instagram, check it out. Um, we repost Matt's content a lot um, because I love sharing all of the critters. I think they play an integral part in the forest and um, they're so fascinating to see. So yes, thank you. Uh, thank you, Matt. Thanks everybody. Have a great night. Yeah. All right, next up, uh, last on our on our list of presentations tonight is uh, none other than uh, Mr. Craig Carey. So Craig, go ahead and unmute yourself. You wanna do a little intro? Uh, sure, you know what, uh, less of an intro. Hi everybody, I'm Craig. Uh, that's, that'll be the extent of my intro. Um, I actually wanna give a couple shout outs in the remaining 13 seconds or so that I have, three to be specific. One to Brian Conant and the LPFA at large for all the work they do to keep our public lands accessible to the public and all the preservation work they do both for the trails and the infrastructure but also the little bits and bobs of history that um we talk about um second maybe the most obscure um shout out um for the evening i didn't know mike shaw was going to be in the crowd tonight and i think he's still here mike your uh, book especially on night photography was a huge inspiration to my girl scouts when i was running troop 201 um, and to see you here tonight was super cool and a, a real sweet surprise. Um, uh, as my girls got older and were getting ready to head off to college, your book was a kind of an anchor for part of our program. Well, they're also wrapped up in their life as college kids and getting ready to leave college and boys and cars and jobs and everything. Um, getting them out for, uh, photographing things at night on our hikes was just a, a sweet, sweet way to end their career as Girl Scouts. So I appreciate that. And then third, and I could do hours of appreciation to Mr. Burtness. Um, as a kid, I had a copy of your Canalino Lodge number 90 OA guide, your Tri-County Hiker's Guide. And it was a huge resource, even more so than Ranger phone calls or even Mr. Gagnon's original books. Um, so to be on the same panel this evening as you, um, super, it's the highlight of my month, so. Uh, super, super stoked to be here, even though you and Mr. McClintock will be hard acts to follow. But I'm ready, Kendra, bring it. Awesome. Okay, I'm sharing now. And... All right, sorry, I'm Good. figuring this out. Okay. Good evening, my party peeps. My name's Craig. We're going to talk a little bit about lookouts in the southern Los Padres. Oh, that is fast. Um, so uh, we're going to talk specifically about three, I think, three or four that are near and dear to my heart. Um, as Mr. Burtness um, alluded in his history of the lookouts and as Mr. McClintock alluded, um, there's a long history between fire spotting and the AWS looking for those Mitsubishi Zeros coming over the Channel Islands after the shelling of Pearl Harbor and of Elwood Mesa. Um, and for years, the Los Padres, the Southern Los Padres specifically, my main stomping grounds, had a huge network of these. Um, you'll see the Camuesa uh, lookout here, which you can read more about in Bob's book, um, was made from native timbers. You'll see that this was actually a lookout tower made of wood. So first, let's please appreciate the irony, right? When a forest is on, when a forest is on fire, it's burning the wood. And so we're gonna make fire lookouts out of wood. Um, didn't end up being a, a super great tactic. We're gonna talk about another that was made from um, from native timbers as well. Um, Camusa Lookout was not a very high one, but you'll see here, we're gonna move forward here, aren't we? All right, 25 on this upper map um, were the lookouts that were still intact uh, back in the day. That included things that aren't even in the, uh, in the forest any longer, like Rincon Mountain, which is now, largely leased by um, Verizon or as, okay, there we go. We got about five of them remaining. This is the original Nordoff tower. We're gonna to talk about two that are along the Nordoff and Topa Topa mountains. And we're gonna talk about two that are along the Pine Mountain Massive tonight. Uh, the Nordoff tower was built in the thirties, um, fell in, it burned in the forties. And they took, if you can imagine this, they took a heavy crane helicopter and took the one from Rincon Mountain and replaced it in the 70s. This picture is using the Osborne Firefinder in its place, um, as Mr. McClintock mentioned. But really, I want to point out 
the manliness factor of this guy in his full denim ensemble and the fact that bottom left, he has a Better Homes and Gardens cookbook, right? That's a man's man right there. All right. So as a night photo, uh, even though Nordoff is super close to the Ohio front country, it's only six miles from the Stewart Debris Basin um, trailhead. Um, great opportunity to get young kids out up on that platform. Um, the superstructure is still there, even if the, uh, the cab is long gone. And it's a great place to practice your night photography, Mr. Shaw. Um, and during the day fire in 06, uh, several condors came and landed and sought refuge on the um, the Nordoff Tower, which I thought, you know, given its proximity to Ojai and all the uh, craziness down there, it was a special treat. Uh, to answer, I believe, Ryan's question, we're going to talk a little bit about Topa Topa Lookout. Originally, wasn't even on the menu. Ryan asked, I figured, hey, let's change our slides real quick. Bam, thanks, Kendra, for accommodating me in that last minute request. This is Topa Topa in the snow, pre day fire. You'll see the uh, Venturi County Sheriff's helicopters there. Um, <laughs> Materials were stored there um, in the event of a deep backcountry rescue was necessary, as you're likely aware. Uh, Topa Topa Peak, well, you know what, even if you weren't, uh, metal frame, 20 feet, uh, built in the late 30s, one of the most expensive up until the second Lacumbre, um, but it's deep within the Condor Sanctuary. So, so since 1951, it was verboten uh, to human um, access with the exception of extreme emergencies. Unfortunately, due to its um, uh, being super distant and very difficult to get to uh, in the 06 day fire, it was not protected as was uh, say the Kuyama and the 07 Zaka fire. So it did not survive. This is what it looks like now. Um, now actually it's also surrounded by a lot of poodle dog bush um, and still technically not legal to access. And the bottom, the floor panels are not in the superstructure. So unlike Nordoff, it's not uh, walkable. This is a photo from the 1927 Reyes Peak. If you've ever done the hike at 7,314 feet on the highest point of the Pine Mountain Massif, either via the road or via the Cerro Grande Trail, this is what the lookout used to look like. Built of native timbers, burned in the 1932 Matillaha fire. Now, just a general word of warning for those of us who wander afoot in our lovely Los Padres. The red is what they call the Reyes Peak Trail. It does not lead to Reyes Peak. It actually heads out to Haydock Peak or Haydock Mountain and then drops down into Haydock Camp along the Jean Marshall Piedra Blanca. That yellow stretch, that little half mile, that's your old trail to Reyes. This is Ranger Green here and his lovely bride on the right and a zoom in of the superstructure that held the Reyes Peak Lookout. Native timbers again, I'm pretty sure they were sugar pines. And sorry, BC, I don't have the photo of uh, Uber Peak Bagger, Masha on this one. Um, we've just got a different one. The story with Reyes Peak, it burned after only, I think five, um, five years, was that the inverted marine layer was so deep, they couldn't, they didn't know the fire was coming until it was basically right upon them. And the stories talk about how the, uh, the uh, lookout man basically, you know, jumped off the side or got down the side of the mountain, you know, barely with his life. These are the remnants of the lookout. There are still um, some of the concrete. There's still some timbers. Every once in a while, you'll find one of the little ceramic insulators from the old phone lines that ran out to the other lookouts and down to Pine Mountain Lodge. Thorn Point, probably my favorite, built in 1932. Uh, or 34, I'm sorry. You can see the cabin down below. This photo on the left was taken in 2013 during a service project that I did on a micro trash cleanup. And on the right was 1940, 1940, so before Pearl Harbor. And that cabin was not down below, leading me to believe it may have been um, like the, the sleepover cabin for the AWS folks. This photo was from 1953, one of my favorites. You can see the uh, cabin has a fresh coat of paint either that light 60s green to which Mr. McClintock alluded or maybe white, always hard to tell. And then another photo from the 70s to celebrate Brian Conant's wardrobe. Um, you'll see here, we've got, uh, we've got uh, all the uh, accoutrements down below, but still just the old shake shingle um, um, water tower or water tank and the old um, bathroom. There's now, if you've hiked up there, there's now a fiberglass bivy hidden way up uh, 
kind of out in the middle of nowhere. Uh, again, in 06, the Thorn Point lookout at 6,935 feet was used as a refuge by condors. And final slide is a close-up. You'll see the cabin. Um, for those who are really down in the weeds, EO Wilson level nerds, these shingles are from a famous cedar shake shingle factory in Seattle, Washington from Sitka, actually Sitka spruces. We found a couple that still had the markings on the underside. Um, after a windstorm, um, a guy from search and rescue and a volu local volunteer and I were up there and uh, just a cool piece of history for you there. That is 21 slides, 20 seconds each, seven minutes. Bam, how you like them apples? Uh, apples. <laughs> it goes pretty quick. <laughs> it really did. Holy cow. <laughs> uh, but thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, think, thanks for having me. I think we needed to hear about that history to round to round out the evening. Um, well, my, my wife said during dinner, um, they're really going to try to limit you to seven minutes. <laughs> and I was like, well, you know, it's going to be one of those best behavior things. Um, but, yeah, well, just so everyone knows, um, we do have lots of projects in the works. And one of those projects that we'd love to get going here in 2021 is an LPFA podcast. So uh, for those folks who do want to continue talking on whatever uh, passion project you might have, um, please shoot me an email. Um, you can send it straight to uh, info at lpforest.org if you'd love to be part of the podcast where we can get into a longer discussion on a variety of Los Padres topics. Um, please let me know. And if anyone has questions um, for Craig, we would love to see them. Bring it. <laughs> Whilst I'm here, let me pitch a book once again. Mr. Burtness's Santa Barbara B-24 Disasters, one of my favorite pieces of local history. Uh, you can still get it on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and a couple other places. Um, oh, what's up, Doug? Um, I just, actually, the last time I saw you was uh, fairly recently there at Thorn Meadow, was it not? I think it was. Um, the cab is in subprime it was right on uh, in sub in sub prime condition. Um, oh, Brian, bless your heart. Um, the there's there's some water damage. The ceiling is about to sag. Uh, somebody took all the insulators that were at the bottom of the metal posts of the bed. So it, it's kind of getting pilfered a little bit. Um, but you know nobody bothered to take the 1970s box of um, of all laundry detergent. So it looks like the rats have been actually chewing on that. That's a bit of a hazmat concern. We might need to hike that out. Um, but I think it's totally salvageable. So um, um, I would love if, if the FFLA and Mr. McClintock or, in, or the LPFA or any interested group could, because um, it's the last one, right? It's the last one with the cabin down below. It's the last one that you can inhabit without having, um, who owns La Cumbre, uh, Cox Communications, without having their... Um, radiation soaked through your bones and, and other parts of your anatomy. So, um, and Thorn is great because it is distant, you know, it's a, it's only a three mile hike. Um, and you, but you have to gain 2000 vertical feet to get there. And that first mile is flat. So it's a hoof to get in there, but it's a great training hike, unless you're trying to chase down teenagers who are like gazelles when you move at an oxen pace, neither here nor there. Um, but it would be a fantastic project. Um, yeah, I just, I love that lookout to death. I think it's really the only viable one that's still in a wilderness area, which I think affords it some level of protection from the knuckleheads who would otherwise um, beat it up. And that's, you know, that's why Nordoff was taken down. Kuyama should have been preserved, but, you know, one winter we went up there and it had blown over. So Thorn is kind of our last chance. And to answer Mr. Conant's question, um, my next edition, um, Hiking in Backpacking Santa Barbara and Ventura, second edition, will be, yes, Mary, you are correct. The fact that Great Valley is closed for so long also helps um, uh, mitigate some of the vandalism that a lot of the lookouts uh, are subject to, to which they are subject. Um, 
second edition of my book, Bri, the short version, it's supposed to be out March 19. Um, obviously, a book tour will look different this year, given restrictions and COVID uh, precautions. Um, but we're trying to figure something, trying to figure something out. We'll see how it goes. I'm excited though. Full color this time. Yeah. There's, oh, you got a piece of history that yours looks awful glossy, which leads me to believe you don't use it much, Bri. Should I show you my collection of beat ass Conant maps? I'm sorry, beat up Conant maps. I should, right? Uh, <laughs> um, you know what, Doug? I haven't quite sorted that out yet. Um, obviously Amazon and all the big boxes will let you, uh, um, pre-order but i would ask if you can you know try to support local first right go to real cheap um real cheap sports down in ventura if you're in my hood go to tecalote or um chaucer's in santa barbara if you can shop there go to mountain air if you're up in the slow area uh try to support your local um and then or you know one of your local outfitters if you're a if you're an R rei um co-op member they've been super supportive i may or may not have seen Sylvia earlier, but Sylvia and REI have been huge supporters of the LPFA and of my book. So, uh, you know, that's always appreciated. Um, Amazon's kind of like your last, last option, sorry, soapbox. No worries. Um, no worries at all. Well, I uh, just want to wrap up the evening. Um, we've got one more plug and that actually is for Mr. Mike Shaw who has graciously um, accepted our invitation to have a night sky photography in the Los Padres workshop. Um, that'll be happening, hi Mike, that'll be happening uh, online at seven o'clock, uh, Wednesday, March 3rd. And we should have uh, the event page up on Facebook um, probably tomorrow or early next week. And we're super excited for that. Um, we can't wait. We're so, we're, I'm, I'm thrilled that that's happening. And I hope to see lots of folks there um, as well as some of our future online events. So make sure if you're not following us um, on our newsletter, you can subscribe on our website. Um, make sure to check us out on Instagram, Facebook, or even on Twitter, if that's your platform. Um, but thank you all so much for being here. Obviously, we wish we could do these kind of events in public, but until then, uh, we'll still be hosting them online and hopefully we can gather again safely um, in the future and see you out on the trails. All right, take care everybody. Thank you so much for coming and stay safe, stay healthy. Bye everyone. Thank you, Kendra. Thank you. Thank you. Nice to see everyone here tonight. Appreciate Bye, it. See you all soon.